nine principles that we are going to take away from the NBME Question Writer Guide. The first takeaway from this guide is to recognize that questions test that the application of knowledge and not just a mere recall of facts, okay? And what happens is, is that when the NBME is making questions, they want to weed out the people who are just memorizing information for the sake of it. Now, the goal of this N these NBME questions is to really assess higher levels of what they mention as Bloom's taxonomy. So what is Bloom's taxonomy? This is, if you take any educational class, this is how adult learning theory is based. First, you have to build the knowledge, but the areas that they really want you to uh, kind of understand it are these up here, in which you're talking about the application, the analysis, synthesis, evaluation. Those are those critical thinking questions that you see all the time when you're doing UWorld. The one point that I will make is that they're not going to ask those recall, just very um, factual kind of information. So as we think about takeaway um, take number one and how it applies, remember that when you're focusing on application, the NBME is going to avoid questions that say the leading cause of death in this population, because that's a memorized fact, if you get what I mean. The NBME also rarely asks for definitions, right? And so rather than being like, what is the definition of autonomy? They are going to assess the ethical principles, for example, in the context of application and how it's relevant to patient care. And so the bottom line here is that memorizing facts from first aid or Anki flashcards, they may help you crush your medical school exams because medical school exams sometimes can be very detail oriented. However, multiple choice questions is going to be the secret to your success because they are going to be focusing on the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. And so when you study basic science material, figure out ways, when you're reading your first aid, figure out ways how the material can be applied or asked in the question so that you can think like the test maker. So that's takeaway number one. Let's go through takeaway number two. Takeaway number two is going to be the following. Apply the important concepts and do not chase the zebras. And what do I mean by that? Well, what you need to focus on are things that are going to be common and that are going to be seen both clinically a lot, as well as as you go through more questions, repeated a lot. And so really try to av um, avoid studying too detailed those zebra points, okay? And so what I would kind of um, uh, ask as a rhetorical question, would it make sense for the NBME to test a rare congenital condition as often as something like heart failure, right? And so you have to kind of keep that balance that rather than going into this very mitochondrial inheritance, mitochondriopathy that causes a dilated cardiomyopathy, well, first, why don't you just master what heart failure is, the physiology and the anatomy changes, the histo changes, et cetera. And so bottom line, don't be that person who freaks out about not knowing every single minutia of every single disease. The action step here is to take the action with high yield resources, because those high yield resources have pretty much what you need to know and strike a balance between being very comprehensive and staying honed in on key concepts. This is extremely important, especially when you're reviewing like a UWorld block. If you take that UWorld block and you are going to be like, oh yeah, now I'm going to watch the Pathoma video related to this, but then the Boards and Beyond video, and then I'm going to watch the sketchy pharmacology because they mentioned something about pharm. You will never get through UWorld review. And so keep that um, uh, thing in mind. Takeaway number three, the number of questions is proportional to the topic's importance. So important topics are going to be weighted more heavily than less important topics. And so the bottom line is, is that just try to make sure that you are looking at big picture things. Like obviously in endocrine, you gotta master diabetes. In cardiology, you gotta master heart failure. The action step here is that things that you have heard of, asthma, heart failure, kidney failure, these are the things that you should focus on getting a fundamental first and then delving into that detail once you have the fundamentals down. Takeaway number four, this is very important, that vignettes force you to apply key concepts. And that's kind of the basis as to how I um, ended up making all of my materials. I knew that vignettes are going to be very, very helpful and important. And so what you have to recognize is that questions with the clinical vignette have the following benefits. Basically, what they want you as a test taker to do is get the authenticity of the examination by trying to help you solve clinical problems. And so that is why 
a lot of the vignettes that even I um, am going to post you and have posted you in our review session all start with like 50 year old male, a five year old child, right? Because these questions help identify those test takers who have memorized just a body of factual information, but it weeds out those people who just memorize and do not apply this information. And so bottom line, a vignette serves as a sample patient and a potential clinical encounter. And this is why we rely on board's material a lot, especially when we're thinking in clinical practice. I always get that medical student who says, oh my gosh, like you're asking me this question. Oh, I remember this from step one studying. And that's because we put in so much effort in step one studying and you're going to use that in your clerkships as you move on. And so form vignettes from concepts is my bottom line. And that's kind of the uh, specialty that I'm going in. All right, very good. So takeaway number five, all questions follow the same format and it is a single best answer and closed responses, right? And closed responses actually refers to the fact that the question is a complete sentence and not a fragment. They won't be like, finish this blank sentence, right? It's not like those Anki minutia cards that are like, finish blank the sentence, right? It is going to be a very pointed question. And so sometimes your medical school exams don't really exhibit this because you can see some questions like this in your medical school exam, but the USMLE won't give those kind of questions, which is things like, determine which of the following is false. All of the following are true except E, all of the above, or the definition of blank is, like I mentioned. So they are going to have those pointed questions. And that's why I say med school exams tend to test that minutia and in this ambiguous test format. And the NBME really pushes on one single best answer, okay? All right, takeaway number six. The NBME says the test taker should be able to answer the item on the stem and lead in alone. So actually, even without the answer choices, they want you to know what's going on in the vignette. And so that is where that strategy, stem, paraphrase, and that last one is predict. That is why I'm so passionate about that predict strategy, because this cover the options rule is actually mentioned in the guide. And essentially, you do not look at the answer choices, or you do not need the answer choices to answer a question. So this is not going to be a question. Which of the following is true about pseudogout? Well, you can't answer this question if I covered all of this stuff up. So that's not going to be a question. And so takeaway number six, remember good questions, even in your question banks, have superb stems. And that's why when you're going through UWorld, for example, pay attention to those stems because they are not asking those uh, questions that you cannot cover up the answers and not know any, uh, anything about the question, okay? So work on your own predictions throughout your practice questions. Takeaway number seven, Remember that the test takers are not trying to trick you. I want to really repeat that to you. As you know, this is USMLE is a standardized exam. So what I'm studying in Atlanta, Georgia is probably the same thing that you're studying in Ohio or even if you're overseas in India, right? This is a standardized exam. So vignettes may be challenging. However, they're really not trying to mislead you here. And so their goal is to avoid these red herring information and to mislead the test taker. And they're actually on your side, right? The, the reason why they are very reluctant to use like real patient cases, they mentioned that real patients are actually very complicated, right? And complicated patients are not necessarily great for assessment. So recognizing that these are going to be very straightforward, critical thinking, but straightforward questions is really, really helpful. And that's why I like to say, especially when you're paraphrasing, Every sentence has a purpose, and those sentences are not trying to mislead you. However, as you're going through, there's pertinent in and pertinent rule outs. That's very important. And so when you're paraphrasing, ask yourself, why is this sentence in the, um, in the actual vignette? What does the test maker want me to rule in or rule out? And we'll kind of go through that in our multiple choice review today. Question number, or uh, takeaway number eight. Vignettes are in the same format as a typical H and P. So they're not going to flash you a set of labs and just say, interpret these labs. They're going to give you a chief complaint in the first few words, right? They're going to give you the past medical history in the first couple sentences. And so helping understand the order of an H and P, which you're probably doing in your uh, clinical um, uh, classes a little bit more, recognizing that chief complaint 
HPI, past medical history, meds, and then your physical exam and labs, those are going to be the uh, progression. And that's how we can understand question structure. And so how I like to um, uh, make an action step on this takeaway is that after you get the chief complaint, especially as you have more content under your belt, remember to try to make like three good differential diagnoses. Even if those are not correct, you will feel more empowered. You will feel very confident as you delve further in that question vignette. And finally, takeaway number nine, the NBME details many aspects to evaluate question validity. And so what metrics they actually use is they'll look at how many um, uh, students got this question correct? How well do the questions discriminate between the high and the low scores? Are there certain um, vignettes that the low scores are also going to be um, uh, getting correct versus the high scores, et cetera, right? And so this change um, is a very important. Um, the change in percentage uh, correct over time is very important, but not necessarily the actual percentage value being like, oh yeah, percent, X amount of percent equals like 245. It's so, it's so dependent on so many other factors. And so remember that when you're trying to survey the topics that are on exam, don't, don't just keep spending time like just blogging and figuring out what's important from a system. Try to master everything. And like I said in the earlier takeaways, is to first get through the common stuff, get through a pass of a high yield resource, and then you can start delving in. The questions will help you. And this is where I kind of want to make this plug that a lot of students, they're like, oh, I'm only getting 45% on my UWorld block, and this person's getting 65, and 65% on UWorld means that you're going to get a 247, and that's not correct. What I want you to focus on from now until your exam day is just focus on actual what? Focus on improvement. Today I got a 48, yesterday I got a 46. That is just one step better than you were yesterday and focus on that progress and don't just focus on that percentage.